from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. All right, we're about ready to get started. Now I know, I know our first two speakers made you very eager and ready to, uh, ready to be further intellectually stimulated. And uh, we have got, we've got just the, uh, just the ticket for that. But before I introduce our first speaker, uh, I want to make a note of something that's going to happen on day two tomorrow. Um, we are having a panel on uh, a funders panel, which will have representatives from uh, National Endowment of the Humanities, uh, National Historical Publications and Records Committee, Commission, and uh, the Institute for Museum and Library Services. And then in the afternoon, we're trying something new. Uh, that, um, we, we, we hope will be well accepted. We're calling it funder speed dating. <laughs> and the idea is that uh, we're gonna have a sign-up sheet and you will have the opportunity to spend 10 minutes face-to-face -face with a funder to be able to ask them whatever you wanna ask them. You can ask them about a specific idea or you can ask them about a type of idea or you can uh, if you've never met Joel Whirl, he's a, he's a wonderful conversationalist. If you just want to talk to Joel ab about anything, you can do that. So there is a sign-up sheet at the registration desk. And I would encourage uh, any of you who are interested in talking with our, uh, our fine uh, funder representatives to sign up. And there are individual slots that you can, you can sign up for. Now with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who's Michael Carroll, who's law professor and director of, program, uh, director of the program on information justice and intellectual property at American University, Washington College of Law. Mike is committed to seeking balance in intellectual property law as new technologies drive how people and organizations create, use, and keep information. He approaches this from both an academic research angle and from direct action. As an academic, he's written a number of insightful publications, which includes titles such as Whose Music Is It Anyway? How We Came to View Musical Expression as a Form of Property. And the best example of Mike's acting on his ideas is that he's a founding member of Creative Commons which most of us, as most of us are well aware, is a global organization that provides free standardized copyright licenses to enable and encourage legal sharing of creative and other copyrighted works. And as most of us know, again, intellectual property concerns can be a barrier to digital preservation and Creative Commons can help us address those concerns. Mike. Thanks very much, and thanks for the invitation. Um, it's a delight to be here. Um, I guess the other hat I wear is, at least uh, for this year, I'm still on the um, National Academy of Sciences Board on Research Data and Information, BERTI, which had a workshop yesterday on digital curation and how do we train uh, basically the next generation of you all um, to be digital curators. Um, so I want to uh, echo Anil's uh, thanks to you for all of the work you're doing and, and support. And I, I think a lot of what you heard from both David and Anil are going to get echoed to some extent uh, by me. Um, so I use this when I do my open access talks to, to sort of talk about the ways in which we're shifting uh, from closed access to open access and scholarly publication. But as I thought about it, the and, and the analogy to the environmental movement is useful for this audience and for our, our purposes today as well um, in, in the following respects. Um, if you think about some of the things that the environmental movement is worried about, that stewardship of the natural resources um, and long-term planning for the use of those, a sustainable use of those, long-term planning about long-term risks 
Um, and, and we're not good at that as human beings. It's now pretty well established. And so a lot of the challenges that you encounter in your uh, trying to advocate for the work you're doing in thinking about why you're motivated to do the work you're doing is analogous to the folks in the, in the environmental uh, movement where you're, you're worried about the long-term preservation of information resources, they're worried more about the, the uh, natural resources. But in terms of the kind of cognitive challenges, the institutional challenges, there are a lot of similarities. So I, one thing to consider is whether there might not be uh, reason to try to formalize some kind of tie to that community uh, periodically to talk about how does one uh, motivate people who are in institutional settings where short-term incentives dominate their thinking to take more seriously long-term risks and long-term planning. Um, so that's point number one for just uh, general consideration. Uh, because it is the information environment that we're talking about and why, and we are definitely in this, still in a new phase of creating this explosion of digital data um, and trying to figure out what to do with it and trying to figure out cost benefit of how much of it do we save. Uh, I guess I would answer your question a little bit differently than uh, David and Anil did in the sense that I think what you heard is that the, the links to the data are part of what makes it meaningful and that the traditional uh, cost benefit about let's get the high value information and let's curate it means that you're diverting some resources to that creation of metadata, creation of the sort of um, the particular presentation of this high value data. And I think what I agree with both of their presentations is you might want to shift that resource allocation a little more to sucking in more of the data, keeping it now, and then adding the meaning the, the meaning layer can be added either through crowdsourcing or there might be partnerships and linkages where the, the meaningful curation can be done. But you can't do that if you give, a, give away the data. So that would be my one sort of addendum to, uh, to their answer. Because it is a new mindset, um, and I think you heard it from both of them, uh, that we need to ad adopt. And I think you're actually on the cutting edge because so many people are still looking at the new thing. It's a new iPhone, it's a new device, it's new, new, new. And you guys are thinking long term. Well, what happens in the long term? And everybody's so caught up in what's next, what's new, that they're not worried about it. They're not worried that they're giving all their valuable data to Facebook and they don't have an agreement with Facebook about what happens in the long term. Um, I mean, so I'm gonna use the an another analogy to estate planning, um, but you think about your Facebook account. Um, is that, to what extent is that part of your leave behind, your legacy? Anil's gonna leave his blog to his son. Are you gonna leave your Facebook account to your grandkids? Uh, if so, how are you, how's that gonna work out? I mean, maybe you don't want to, right? Maybe you wanna edit it. The governor of New York, according to today's New, New York Times, is editing the record while he was the attorney general of the state. Um, uh, and so maybe we want to edit before leaving behind, but you at least, I assume, would want to have some ability to control some of those decisions, but you don't currently have a deal with Facebook that allows you to do that. Um, so now I want to talk about the role of copyright in this environment, and here's a, a conceptual point to think about um, um, the role of copyright in the work you're doing. So let's just take the layer of digital data. It's a bunch of zeros and ones that can then uh, 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 be represented in different ways. Um, so that's, let's just treat that as kind of a thing, right? The digital things that, you, that you're worried about preserving and, and we can figure out about what format, what files, et cetera. Intellectual property rights are a kind of intangible layer that attaches to those things. So copyright attaches to those things. And it's useful then to think about that because as you think about the ways in which intellectual property rights in our rights to control the use of those things, access, copying, distribution, adaptation of those things. So the rights can be looked at as a thing as well, even though they're intangible. So there are rights that someone else owns that attaches to the thing that you have, ac that you have uh, control over and that you're trying to preserve. Um, and so there, there's the management of the digital data and then there's the management of the rights associated with that data. Um, and that's the copyright challenge for digital preservation. Um, 
And because the copyright lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years, um, then managing the copyright issues is a long-term problem as well. Um, and so, um, and the other reason I find it useful to think about these two things is that the workflows as a practical matter may be different. The person whose job it is to worry about how the digital data will be stored, what formats, you know, what, uh, what, what the long-term uh, preservation of that data, that can be one person's problem and managing the rights in that data can be someone else's problem so that you can uh, get more specialization. Um, and so that's why I would think it's useful to, to think about that. Now, I'm gonna talk about Creative Commons, but Creative Commons responds to changes in the, in the legal infrastructure around the information environment. And so I wanna give you a couple points about that legal baseline before we talk about what Creative Commons does. Uh, once upon a time in the US, you had to opt into the copyright system. You had to publish with notice, you had to register with the copyright office, you had to deposit a copy. Um, and, and if you didn't do all of those things in the very beginning, you gave up your claim to copyright, what you published went straight into the public domain. Um, over time, we dialed back those formalities, those requirements. For a long time, it was dialed down to just having to cop publish with Circle C. But you'd be surprised at the number of people who failed to publish with Circle C. And so all of that material pri published prior to March 1st, 1989, if you don't see Circle C on it, is in the public domain in the United States. Right, subject, if it, if it is from a US author. Um, uh, but, so all of that stuff's in the public domain, so when we're thinking about, is that a set of rights I need to manage or not, that at least gives you some lines where you can say, okay, fine, this is in the public domain, I don't have to worry about the rights workflow, I can just worry about the digital data workflow. Um, Moreover, you get more information going into the public domain because you had to stay, you had to opt to stay in the copyright system in, uh, after 28 years if you didn't renew your copyright. Um, you, went into, you went into the public domain and the data show that the majority of copyright owners did not value their copyright sufficiently and they let it go. Um, so we had a lot of people not opting in in the first place. We had a lot of people opting out by not renewing. Um, but once the United States decided to join the international system, we gave up the flexibility that, the, that those opt-in, opt-out provisions had, and we now live in a world of automatic copyright. And so that's one of the problems to which Creative Commons respond. Now I've got this um, uh, political legal risk because we all have a bit, some of a risk management uh, filter on the way we look at these things. I need to warn you about the public domain. Um, uh, the Supreme Court in the Golan case upheld Congress's power to restore copyright to foreign works that uh, did not follow the opt-in, opt-out rules. Um, and the way copyright works is it's territorial. If you want copyright in the US, you have to play by US rules. If you want copyright in Europe, you play by European rules. European authors have always had automatic copyright since the late 19th century. They never thought to play by the US registration and no publication with notice rules. Um, for a long time, we were comfortable saying, you do it your way, we'll do it our way. In the United States, your work is in the public domain. Once the US joined the, the international system and signed up, we agreed to restore those copyrights. So the things that people thought were in the public domain were taken out of the public domain by Congress and the Supreme Court upheld Congress's power to do that largely, uh, in my view, dismissing the constitutional basis for the public domain. I raise it as a, a, a continuing political legal risk because the logic of the court's decision would suggest that if there were a lobby group to suggest that all of those people who failed to renew their copyrights or published without notice might want to have those restored, um, the Supreme Court's not going to do anything to stop Congress from doing that. So there's a potential political risk that now that we have this precedent for foreign works, why not give back copyrights to all the US authors as well? I don't, there's no piece of legislation pending at the moment, but it's just something to be aware of that's in the environment. I've got the Hathi uh, reference because as you know, there's litigation against the Hathi Trust 
uh, because they made some determinations about works that were orphans and made some judgments about how fair use works based on the orphan status. It's now alleged in the litigation that, there were, that the authors of those works are known, um, and therefore, but, but the strategy that the plaintiffs have used was not at all to negotiate or try to find a resolution. It's clearly an, a, a, an attempt to chill the kind of innovative work that the Hathi Trust is doing with these, uh, the, these digitized um, um, books in order to scare them out of that space. Um, so, and there's some really worrisome ar arguments being made for those of you who do anything touching the, the law. There's an argument that if uh, preservation or archival activity falls within the library exception in copyright law, then you're not allowed to use fair use. That's a shocking to me, stunning argument. No one ever thought that was the deal. Everyone thought you have section 108 plus fair use. And this is an argument that says either or. Uh, I am hopeful that that argument will go down in flames, but be aware there are risks in the environment um, out there about um, uh, what you can and can't do. So we can't act as if the legal environment's stable, it's dynamic. Um, okay, so we now live in a, a world of automatic copyright and all you need is a minimal spark of creativity. So you snap a photo, copyright. You organize a database, copyright, right? Copyright attaches itself to this data automatically without question um, and it lasts for life of the author plus 70 years. Um, and many of the owners who, of these copyrights get them automatically and do not think long term. They don't think about their own life plus 70 years. Maybe they're interested in controlling and using this copyright in the short term, but they have no long term plan for the copyright. So it's, it's a natural response. It's, it's something to be expected, but it's fundamentally it's irresponsible. It creates the orphan works problem that we're now struggling with that, that was at the heart of the whole Google Books um, uh, fiasco, right? Because Google Books was all about the orphan works and if you want in q and I can explain why that's true. Um, but, but, and that means that this automatic copyright gets in the way of a lot of valuable digitization projects, digital preservation projects. Um, and we gotta think about ways to get copyright out of the way. Um, so one is ownership has its limits. Um, uh, I think that, that uh, this argument in the Hatsi litigation will, be, uh, not, will not be accepted. Fair use has an active and important role to play. Um, it was very nice that Anil and Dave both used Creative Commons photos in their presentation, but I would argue they had a fair use right to use those photos anyway in this setting. Um, so as much as important as I think the Creative Commons licenses are for extending use rights, Let's remember that they extend from the baseline of existing use rights in the law, including fair, first sale, fair use, uh, the section 108, and other rights. Um, and it's important that those are, if you don't use those rights, they will, they will decay over time. So it, and I think in pre preservation in particular, we can make, even if their fair use might be uncertain in some ways, as a lawyer, I'm pretty, I'd be pretty confident in giving some fair use opinions about some basic preservation activities. Making copies for the purpose of pre preserving them is a socially beneficial use that is unlikely to have any kind of market harm to the copyright owner. And so I think there's a presumption that making the copy itself, storing it, is a fair use. Unless there's an active market for that kind of activity that you might be inhibiting. Um, the storing, at least, uh, ought to be something that you shouldn't be deterred by, in, in my own view. It's not legal advice because, you know, we got to be careful, but, but it's, it's legal information, right? And that's my general view is that you ought to have a bias toward believing you have a fair use right to preserve things. Um, now, when, when it comes to giving access to that which is preserved, then the fair use calculus has to be uh, more refined. We have to look at what the existing modes of access are, potential access, et cetera. But fair use really has an active role to play in the digital preservation uh, uh, field. Um, and, and so particularly when we're worried about evanescent material that might disappear from the web, um, you know, I would grab it um, and, and, and just store it and then figure out 
sort of how to manage, you know, how to work with the copyright owner's rights in it. But you, I, I would treat fair use as a user's right in that respect and for purposes of preserving. And, you know, the Library of Congress, you know, political campaign websites, storing and ar archiving those, that's really important digital data to, to grab. Um, and, and if you look at, I realized that not everyone treats the Internet Archive as a real archive, and Brewster's not a real librarian in lots of people's views, but let's face it, he just went out and started copying the web, um, and he got a couple of hassles, but lawyers ended up coming to really like the Internet Archive. We used it in litigation that I was involved in, where people changed their website after they got the <laughs> cease and desist letter. Um, and so, for better or worse, the Internet Archive uh, went ahead and did it, and if you can it, you look at the evidence, it's still up and it's still rolling along. So, so please don't be overcautious about that piece of the preservation puzzle. Um, now, digital rights management's a little harder, and I agree, especially as we move into the ebook market, um, uh, where the digital rights management may serve as a stronger barrier. Um, the the use rights are less well articulated. There are a few exceptions. The library exception is pathetic, right? It's, you have a right to hack the DRM to decide whether you want to buy the content. <laughs> really? Okay. Um, um, the copyright owners were so generous in conceding to that. Um, <laughs> but one important thing, you do have a First Amendment right to circumvent technological protection measures when doing so gives you the right to exercise your free speech rights. And if the government tries to punish you for exercising your free speech rights, the statutory prohibitions fall away because First Amendment is a constitutional right that overrides anything that Congress said in the DMCA. Now, we have a, an appellate opinion that says, yes, you have a First Amendment right, and the First Amendment effectively works as the fair use provision for hacking DRM. What we don't have is a lot of uh, uh, case precedent of when your First Amendment rights kick in. We, that court said you don't have a First Amendment right to post code that allows you to hack the D DVD uh, encryption, um, but it did recognize that you do have a First Amendment right. So again, a, a preservation activity where the material is otherwise going to decay, become unavailable, um, I would say that's a pretty strong speech interest, um, th and there are a lot of public interest lawyers that would be willing to uh, take that representation if someone was worried about uh, doing that even on a large scale. Um, also, as we'll talk about in a minute, the Copyright Office has a proceeding. They have the power to create exceptions to the DMCA every three years. Um, I have not seen the preservation community go to the uh, librarian or to the, the Register of Copyrights and ask for one, um, but it, you, you might think about that if DRM is really getting in the way. Okay, so I've got two big asks and maybe a, I'll sneak a third one in there for you. Uh, I'm a teacher, so I'm, I like to give assignments, right? So, um, so going to your conversation with Anil, I think this is really important. The, the fact that you, this community has a different perspective than the, the one that most web users have, that most people interacting with digital data, the, the longer term perspective, gives you a special place in the ecosystem. And, and I would ask you then to take that special perspective and be the voice of future users on behalf of them speak to the now about what's needed, about the behaviors, the institutional arrangements that are undermining long-term preservation. Um, and, and here the challenge is the same one that Anil gave, it, which is, um, you know, the attention span of everyone is so limited, you can't give the whole, you know, uh, kitchen sink ask. There have to be very specific things to ask for, or at least articulate. Uh, one other way to do this is rather than asking for specific things, ask the questions. Go to Facebook and say, okay, what's your long-term preservation plan, right? What happens if you go bankrupt? What happens to all your users' data? Does it all go into the bankruptcy estate and get sold to someone else? Do the users have any right to say? And if you think about the shutdown of mega up upload as a sort of wake-up call for a lot of people about how vulnerable their data is, 
Um, that's the kind of moment where if the community had a way of being organized, a mouthpiece, they, that would have been a perfect point to co be quoted by the reporter as saying, you see, companies like Mega Upload don't have a contingency plan. What's your contingency plan? And if you go to every company and say, what's your contingency plan? And if you look at what the academic publishers have listened to the library community when they've been asked, and they've responded, well, Loxus or Portico, or we'll, we'll come up with some deal to ensure the long-term availability of this material that you're paying for these, because they're no longer distributing uh, printed artifacts, they're now uh, distributing, um, uh, it's, they're now selling database access. So what happens when the database goes dark, right? That's, and, and that's really what we're now asking in the larger, uh, in the larger community. What happens when pieces of the larger uh, database go dark? Um, in the public policy arena, if this community had a focused voice, these are all public policy uh, uh, events where it would be fantastic for the preservation perspective to be voiced. And, and I, I don't treat it as the sort of advocacy that the library community n is currently doing, which is often not as preservation focused. I think it would be useful in addition to the open access advocacy and some of the other things to have a distinct voice for the preservation activity in the public policy space. So for orphan works legislation, uh, right now we don't have copyright term extension pending, but if it were to come back, hopefully we could beat it down and having the preservationists at the table to be able to say, extending copyright just makes our job all the more harder, here's why, um, and going to the librarian and asking for exceptions to DRM, et cetera. Um, and last, I'll come back to but uh, the conversation you started with Anil about don't think about policy articulation as only being directed at public policymakers. In effect, Facebook is a policymaker, right, when it writes its terms of service. Google is a policymaker. Um, and you can negotiate with them as users have when they've sort of expressed outrage at ter terms in the d of the deal the deal gets changed. So again, if you can be part of that conversation by having a mouthpiece, um, I, you can have influence. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about Creative Commons. I'm running out of time. So we are also 10 years old. It's interesting that these two uh, uh, things have, have come along at the same time. Um, because copyright attaches automatically, our view was that we wanted to um, find a way to respond to that or let people opt out of the normal understanding of what copyright ought to be and opt into a more open sharing mode um, in the digital environment. So we, our way of responding to that was to also become uh, legislators, if you will. We wrote standard terms, standard licenses where we tried to be sort of lawyers to the deal, meaning we tried to figure out what licensors would need from a license in order to be willing to give their content out under the license and then what licensees would need in order to make active use of the shared materials and, and so that was the theory. Um, so we said, well, here seem to be the toggle points that people care about. Licensors wanna get credit for the work they've done. Um, they may wanna demand that if you build upon their creativity that you then share yours back into the commons under the same terms. So you take those first two and that's Wikipedia, uh, attribution share alike. Some people just are so averse to the idea of making money off my stuff. So you can share it, you can use it, but you can't make money off my stuff. So that's the non-commercial condition. Some people say you can republish it, reuse it, but don't change it. Um, and when you mix and match those, you get six different permutations. So the most open is attribution. That's do anything you want with it, just give me credit. The most closed is, give me credit, only make non-commercial use and don't change it, All right? Um, we also have two tools that are useful for this community and I wanna reemphasize them. Um, the public domain dedication, CC0, is a way to give away the copyright. Yes, I got this automatic copyright, that's not what I want, I hereby give it back to the public. Zero rights of control, I've given it away. The other is the public domain mark, which is not a license, it's a label. This is just a way of marking using the same metadata that we mark the licensed works with to say this object is in the public domain. One warning, 
only use that mark if it's in the public domain around the world. Uh, so if you think about you know, US government works, U.S. law says there's no copyright for the product of federal employees within the scope of their employment, but that's U.S. law. Foreign governments impose copyright in their territories on U.S. government works. And the U.S. government then owns those foreign copyrights as assets, and at least in my conversations so far, have been unwilling to give those away under CC0, but perhaps um, the library and other public sector entities might be willing to just do an attribution license for those foreign copyrights to things that are otherwise in the public domain in the U.S. But right now, we don't have the mark that says public domain in the U.S., copyright in France. Uh, and we're sort of debating about whether it's worth building such a tool. It would not be easy. And we're not clear that there's a real user base out there that needs that. But if there is, please let us know. But otherwise, please be aware the public domain mark is really for Shakespeare, for stuff that's you know older 19th century stuff um, and, and earlier. Uh, so that's sort of the spectrum. Um, and we've got kind of the three layers, right? We've got a, 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 the, the deed that says, uh, this is the basic terms of the deal. If you want more detail, here's the more detail. And then we've got um, uh, metadata that can be used, machine readable representation of the license so that um, the machine can then figure out um, it, or reflect back to you what the basic terms of the deal are. Um, so we can only measure links, link backs to the license because when you put a CC license on your page, you create a link and this again goes to the, if you're on the open web uh, point. So the, this graphic was as of 2011, we're now up to 500 million link backs. So I don't know exactly how many openly licensed objects there are on the web, but those links roughly correlate with the number of objects. So that means all of those things are under a license that say you are free to copy and re give back. So for digital preservation perspective, if you want a test bed for experimenting on stuff, the CC licensed corpus is ripe and waiting for you to uh, go, go to town with that because all of those licenses give you the right to make copies, to republish, um, and then you have to look at the other conditions to see what, what else you want to do. Um, but at least in sort of copy, republish, that activity is all, uh, all licensed under the CC license. Um, the idea drew in uh, interest from around the world. We've got volunteer affiliate teams from 72 countries that have done something to translate the licenses into their local language and make adaptations when necessary to accommodate local law. Uh, Wikipedia has uh, migrated it to it, um, and you can, uh, you can, uh, it is not only digital works, analog works can also be licensed under CC. You just say, this thing is licensed under that license, right? Because if you're not giving an exclusive license, all of these are non-exclusive, which means they're effectively a permission, um, you can do that quite casually. You can just say, here, this is, th this is permission. Um, all right, so what's in the commons? All kinds of things. This is a leave behind, so you can, if you aren't already familiar, um, you will find these. Okay, I was gonna do a little song and dance in the dark, but I've got two minutes left, so we're gonna fast forward and ask n number two. Um, what can the preservation community do, do to promote copyright practices with the things that are getting created today? How do you, put in the minds of the creators or the Facebooks or the Googles the long-term preservation um, as a, how can you affect their daily practices? Um, so um, I, I think that's a challenge for the community. I'll give you a couple of suggestions and be interested um, if there's time later or at the break to talk about it. Um, so one is let's just mark the, public, the digital public domain. Let's just mark things that are already in the public domain as being in the public domain so that people can start to become more aware of the difference between what's in copyright and what's not. They don't see the public domain right now. It's invisible because it's not marked. Um, and so if we mark it, then it, it creates a consciousness about what the public domain is, and people start to realize when they are relying on the public domain, building upon it, et cetera. Um, and I've got a little blog post linked there about what, why I think that's important. Um, 
encourage, I've always thought that long-term preservation is one of the outcomes that the, that the Creative Commons licenses will enable um, because it is this corpus of things that people are free to, co uh, to, to copy, store, and make lots of copies of. So, you know, it, it has a better chance of survival than some of the other things. Um, um, if not, think about contingency planning. This is one thing that people, we, we, don't, we don't publicize or promote this that much at Creative Commons, um, but in, in property law, there's a, what's called a springing interest, which means it's a property interest that comes into existence if a contingency occurs. So you can think about the open license as a springing license, that is, I can grant you a Creative Commons license today that only comes into being or only comes into effect if some contingency uh, occurs. So I could take this preservation and say, 10 years from today, this preservation is under a Creative Commons license. From a legal perspective, I have granted that to you right now, but its legal effect doesn't take place until 10 years from today. So we could talk about people who are treating their copyrights as proprietary material and say, okay, I understand that right now that's the way you want us to relate to this, but can you give us some, at some future time, can you agree that it goes into the commons? How about 50 years from now? We can at least diminish the orphan works problem if people have some time value horizon for when they've made their money and they're willing to let things go so that it can be full copyright now, creative commons later. Um, and if it's not a time contingency, are there other events, like in the event of bankruptcy, all this stuff goes, in, uh, goes out under a Creative Commons license. So this, again, is something that this community might work with digital publishers, dig creators of digital d uh, data to think about. Um, uh, the last is, even if it's under full copyright, let's at least mark, mark it up. And I am done now. I violated the normal keynote role of I didn't have lots of fancy graphics and pretty pictures and everything, so here's a pretty picture. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.